Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. I have a question for you. Can you separate the art from the artist? Or is there a line at which the two become entwined? I ask this because today I'm talking about a very controversial creator. Controversial not just for the statements that he's made, which have alienated a large percentage of his audience, but because he did so after successfully building himself quite a large platform. He has a lot of success. This is a guy who was a pioneer in self-publishing and one of its biggest success stories. Uh, he did everything on his own terms and he holds the North American record for the most consecutive comics created by a single creator. I'm talking about Canadian artist Dave Sim. He's a writer, an artist, and a publisher who created 300 issues of Cerebus. And today I want to talk to you about his techniques and his personal tropes throughout the run of Cerebus. Then we can talk about his successes as a self-publisher. And finally, once you have all that background, we can dig into some of the controversies surrounding him. Born in Ontario in 1956, Dave Sim grew up reading comics by Bernie Wrightson and various Mad Magazine creators, and went on to work on various fanzines throughout the early 70s. In 1975, Sim began working on a comic strip called Beavers, and published them in a book in 1976. But his work the following year would go on to define the majority of his career. In December of 1977, Dave Sim began writing, illustrating, and self-publishing the black-and-white comic Cerebus. Cerebus began its life as a cross between a funny animal comic and being a parody of Conan the Barbarian. Cerebus was an aardvark barbarian. The character was designed by Sim in 1976 to be the mascot for his then-girlfriend Denny Lubert's idea for a fanzine, which she intended to call Cerebus. Her actual aim was to name it Cerberus after the famous three-headed dog from mythology, but misspelled it. Her fanzine never came out, but she helped Sim self-publish his comic book version the following year, and co-founded and managed their own publishing imprint, Aardvark Vanaheim Press. Initially, the book came out bi-monthly, and for the first two years' worth of stories, the stories were short one- to three-issue story arcs that had a lot of sword fights and sorcery, like the Conan comics at the time. But by issue 26 in May of 1981 through May of 1983's issue 50, a 25-issue storyline called High Society took place. If you're going to read Service, this is where I recommend you begin, because for the first two years, the artwork is rougher, and honestly, there's not much of a direction other than just being a broad satire of the popular Conan comics of the time. But by High Society, Dave Sim's goals completely changed. He soon began telling the press that his aim was to go for 300 issues and tell a 6,000 page novel, essentially. Uh, and he accomplished this. Uh, his goals became much more epic, and he aimed to create a comic book that would allow him to discuss politics, religion, and philosophy. Without diving too deeply into the plot of every arc throughout Cerebus' long run, it's worth noting that the first huge arc of High Society features several of Dave Sim's tropes. There are characters in his stories that mimic the physical appearance and personality of celebrities, like Lord Julius, who looks like Groucho Marx. There's also the recurring character of Artemis Roach, who constantly takes on new looks designed to directly parody popular superhero comics at the time, like Moon Knight, Punisher, and Wolverine. Other important supporting characters introduced early on include Red Sophia, a parody of Red Sonia, who Cerebus marries, and Jaka, a dancer who Cerebus falls in love with. Issue number 20 introduced the important religious sect known as the Cyrenists, a cult-like organization who operate in a matriarchal society. Finally, the book focuses on the philosophical teachings of the fictional Suentius Poe. The conflicting religions, political figures, and business owners try to manipulate the simple Cerebus and frequently underestimate him. Over the course of the books, Cerebus becomes a prime minister, the pope, a bartender, and a house guest. In the High Society story arc, he is used as a pawn by both Lord Julius, the leader of a city-state, and Astoria, a representative of the Cyrenists. 
He becomes popular with the public and is elected prime minister, but squanders his role by launching an unnecessary and unpopular war that gets him run out of town. That's an important aspect of Cerebus, the main character. He actually is not a very good person, and in many ways his personality is self-defeating. He's a barbarian. He's aggressive, a misogynist, and selfish. In the next story arc, Church and State, a big change occurred with regards to the artwork. Dave Sim hired artist Gerhard in issue number 65, and he continued to work on the title until the final issue, 300. Gerhard worked on the backgrounds, which allowed Sim to focus purely on the characters and to develop his cartooning. Honestly, I don't think that the artwork across the first 25 issues is much to brag about. It isn't bad per se, but it isn't great either. But that said, Dave Sim did continue to improve as a cartoonist, and by issue 100, the artwork was very, very good. Uh, Dave Sim created very expressive characters. The environments and the structures are gorgeously rendered, and so is the shading. It all looks fantastic. Cerebus returns to the city of East and is manipulated by a man named Weishaupt. Weishaupt has organized a tenuous federation of various states of which he intends to be the president that will unite against the Cyrenists. Weishaupt intends to manipulate Cerebus into becoming prime minister again, tricking him into a drunken marriage with Red Sophia. But before he can go any further, Bishop Powers appoints Cerebus as Pope. Cerebus goes mad with power. Astoria is imprisoned, and Cerebus uses his powers as Pope to grant himself a divorce from Red Sophia, marries Astoria, rapes her, and then grants himself a divorce. During Astoria's trial, Cerebus ascends to a cosmic level and meets the judge, based on the look of playwright Jules Pfeiffer, who tells him that he will eventually die alone, unmourned, and unloved. He tells Cerebus that if he's ever curious why he suffers so much, he should remember his second marriage to Astoria. Cerebus returns to his world, Starcian, and finds that the Cyrenists have conquered the city while he was away. He spends the next arc hanging out in a bar run by Pud and falls for a dancer named Jaka. He becomes the house guest of Jaka and her husband Rick, a genuinely good person. Cerebus eventually leaves to head to town and returns to find the Cyrenists have destroyed the bar, killed Pud, and told Rick that Jaka had an abortion granting them a divorce and sending them on their separate ways. From here, Cerebus becomes more experimental. An arc focuses on the last days of writer Oscar Wilde, with Cerebus only appearing in a few pages. This is followed by four arcs comprising a larger arc known as Mothers and Daughters that delves into the history of the Cyrenist sect. Some of those issues ended up being primarily text with minimal illustrations. Cerebus also ascends again and meets his creator, Dave. He then returns and becomes a bartender. He eventually comes across Rick again, who has aged and become a heavy drinker. Rick has slightly lost his mind and is working on a new religious text that has Cerebus as a type of prophet. Rick leaves and Jaka returns, agreeing to go with Cerebus on a journey to see his home and his parents. Cerebus feels a sense of urgency, but indulges in Jaka's desire to make appearances and shop. The journey takes a long time, and when they return to Cerebus' home, it's revealed his parents have recently passed away. Cerebus lashes out at Jaka and drives her away. And in the final two arcs, things get really weird. Cerebus returns from his homeland, despondent, and plans to die in battle with the Cyrenists. Instead, he comes across a cult based on the writings of Rick, who expect a revelation from Cerebus. Published over the course of a year, the chapters are primarily text, with Cerebus looking at the reader. Cerebus reveals his ideas on religion, which are sort of based off of the Torah. It successfully leads to people overturning the Cyrenists. At the end, it's revealed that Cerebus has told his story to a reporter, who looks like Jaka, and he marries her. Then the story jumps forward. Cerebus is now very old, decrepit, and in pain. He has an epiphany that he struggles to cross his room and write it down. He hides the epiphany, and it's implied that they won't be revealed for 2,000 years. Outside, society has collapsed. The populace is now engaged in the so-called feminist, homosexualist ideas of the mother of Cerebus's son, Shep Shep.
Cerebus remembers them having a perfect father-son relationship, but when he visits, Shep Shep reveals that they never got along, and Shep Shep follows his mother's teachings. People are encouraged to be pedophiles, juvenile drug users, and worse. Cerebus pulls a knife to kill his son, but trips and breaks his neck, dying alone in his room as prophesied. He finds himself on a journey towards the light and sees his old friends, but realizes Rick isn't there and understands he's being drawn to hell. Okay, so that was a lot to go over, and I'm just giving you the broadest overview so that we can all be on the same page. In terms of Dave Sims' techniques and his personal tropes, uh, you can look at this and there's a lot of satire and humor. Some of that is dated because it was based on things that were current at the time, like certain superheroes. Uh, there's also a lot to recommend it in terms of how the artwork does evolve, and it becomes really gorgeous artwork. Uh, there's a lot of nuanced character work. There's a really impressive amount of world building. Uh, that's definitely something to recommend it. Uh, that said, this is 300 issues of story to fill, and the way Dave Sim approached that is he basically wrote about whatever interested him at the time, and sometimes that could be very tangential to Cerebus's story. Uh, there are issues where we're focusing on a character based off of a real-world person. The story arc Melmoth focuses on the final days of uh, Oscar Wilde. Very tangential to Cerebus. There are also long chapters that are basically just text. Uh, it's essentially Dave Sim espousing his personal philosophies through various characters. And personally, I find that very dull. It's very stretched out. But now that we know what the story is, let's talk about Dave Sim's accomplishments with self-publishing. When Dave Sim started self-publishing in 1977, it was not very common. It was much trickier to get distribution. Dave Sim published his Cerebus comics with the help of Denny Lubert. Lubert and Sim were married from 1978 through 1985. Lubert continued to manage Aardvark Vanaheim Press through 1985's issue 77 of Cerebus, at which point she founded her own publishing company, Renegade Press, and the handful of non-Cerebus titles that they were publishing, like Flaming Carrot, moved with her or went elsewhere. In 1981, Dave Sim began publishing Swords of Cerebus, which collected four issues at a time, plus a new backup story. These reprints were a great way for new readers to get caught up. By 1984, Cerebus was selling very well, at its peak, selling 36,000 copies a month. That was fantastic for an independent comic. In 1986, Sim decided to print all of High Society in what he called a phone book because of its resemblance to phone directories at the time. Essentially, they were some of the very first trade paperbacks. This was not a common way to do reprints, and Sim actually began by having them available purely through mail order, and he fulfilled them himself. This upset a lot of comic book stores who had supported his indie book, but it was a financial windfall for Sim himself, cutting out the middleman. It was also early enough that it helped invite new readers into his growing story. It's important to explain what a big deal this was at the time. Uh, at this point in time, comic book stores were getting comics that were maybe up to 80 pages, and they'd tap out at about $15. There wasn't anything new that was more expensive than that. And Dave Sim was about to release a 500-page book priced at $25. It was brand new to the industry. And it upset a lot of the distributors because Dave Sim was saying, like, I want to sell something that's much more expensive and I want to negotiate brand new terms because this is unlike the regular floppies. I want a different percentage for everything. Uh, didn't make them happy. So he decided, you know what? Fine. I'll cut out the middleman. I'll sell it myself. He did very well there, but it did not make the distributors happy. In fact, Diamond Distribution retaliated by refusing to carry a title Aardvark Vanaheim solicited, called Puma Blues by Steve Bissett and John Totalbin. The book ended up being published by Mirage Studios instead. Nevertheless, Cerebus continued to release its arcs in big collections, ultimately releasing 16 of them to cover the whole run. They sold well, and it opened the door to companies like DC opting to reprint The Dark Knight Returns as a hard cover shortly after this, realizing there was an audience for more expensive collected editions. 
Sim realized a $100,000 profit on high society, and he was known to show up at small press conventions in limos and to foot the bill for big dinners with creators after the convention. He was also motivated to help come up with something called the Creator's Bill of Rights. The idea behind the bill was to have its signatory state to the comics industry that they owned their work, deserved credit for it, and had the right to distribute their comics how they deemed appropriate. Many independent creators and self-publishers signed, including ElfQuest's Richard Peeney, Tales of Bean World's Larry Martyr, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles' Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, along with Dave Sim, who helped draft the first iteration of the bill. The bill was finalized in November of 1988, with Scott McCloud being the primary author of the final version. Ultimately, I can't find any concrete evidence that the Creator's Bill of Rights had an impact on the comics industry. But it was a bunch of creators letting their opinions be known, trying to upset the status quo, and that's never a bad thing. But now it's time to get into Dave Sims' controversies. Uh, there seems to always be a qualifier when reviewing Dave Sims' work. Maybe it's the inconsistency in terms of how entertaining you find service, uh, maybe it's the fact that his parody and satire tends to get dated. Funny then, kind of a novelty now. But what I really need to talk about is his problematic views on women and his persecution complex. I mentioned before that Dave's wife helped found Aardvark Vanaheim, and they divorced in 1985. But he also drove away the other women that worked for him. Karen McKeel was a secretary at Aardvark Vanaheim through 1988. Diana Schutz served as a proofreader between 1994 and 2001. At that time, Dave Sim wrote a diatribe against former friend Jeff Smith, who self-published Bone. The long and short of it is that Sim challenged Smith to a boxing match, and Schultz was offended by it, especially since she had helped originally introduce them and considered Smith a friend. I also have no idea how a boxing match was meant to resolve their differences. That's about as sensible as saying a tug of war is the way that we'll decide on the public policy for educational grants. It doesn't make any sense. Dave Sim has a problem with women. He calls himself an anti-feminist, but that's ultimately wordplay. He also says that, quote, it wouldn't be that big a stretch to categorize my writing as hate literature against women in this fascistic feminist country. He has written extensively about how women think emotionally and only men think rationally. In the infamous issue number 178 of Cerebus, a mostly written essay with minimal illustration takes over the comic. It's written by the fictional character Victor Davis in an illustrated book known as a Reed in Cerebus's world. In the previous few issues of the story arc, Sim had the Reeds express his views on creativity and not selling out. And in issue 178, he writes about gender, saying a female void focuses on feeling and the male light focuses on reasoning. Sim went on to speak in interviews with overt misogyny, arguing that women waste their time with thought and compared them to leeches. He said that if people could choose their genders, everyone would be a male. And then he acts persecuted because of it. He's incredibly defensive. And a prime example is his 2004 interview with the AV Club. That was an interview he did as the series wrapped up, and it really shows his snarky defensiveness at its peak. It's possible he did this to himself back in the late 70s. Two years after starting Cerebus, Dave Sim took LSD for a solid week and ended up having a nervous breakdown. He was admitted to the hospital for schizophrenic-like symptoms. Shortly after he was released, he revealed his plan to have Cerebus run for 156 issues through 2003. Shortly after this, he changed from a bi-monthly to a monthly schedule and revised his estimate to 300 issues finishing in 2004, which he ultimately accomplished. But I have to wonder if the drug use permanently altered him. There's no way to know. It's just a possibility. Maybe the strain of his gargantuan goal made him argumentative. He'll tell you that he's thinking rationally, and anyone who disagrees with him can't form a coherent argument, which is a bit paranoid. But his biggest controversy was revealed in recent years, where he admitted to starting a relationship with a 14-year-old fan just after his divorce. He stayed in touch with this girl for the next six years, grooming her and eventually having sex with her. This isn't speculation. He's admitted it in his own writing, and you can read in his own words where he talks about how girls have prettier features when they're younger. 
When you look at Cerebus, it's a massive accomplishment. It's 27 years worth of a continuous story by one author. There's very little in comics like it, although Eric Larson is approaching it with Savage Dragon, and some Japanese manga artists have accomplished similar lengthy runs. As to what it's about, it's not as simple as saying that it's about the life and times of a barbarian aardvark, because there are long stretches that are not directly about Cerebus and are tangential to his story. I would argue that if you wanted to approach Cerebus on a purely critical analysis of the material, that you could look at it as a story of subjective truth versus objective truth. Uh, but personally, I don't have a lot of interest in rereading this book. Um, it's, in, it's inconsistent. I liked it in the 80s. Uh, there were high points, stories that I really liked. I liked High Society, I liked Church and State, and then there were tangential issues that really bored me and made it a chore to read, in my opinion. Uh, I think that there are some other good stories later on. I think that Jaka's story, Rick's story, and Going Home are all pretty interesting, but there are some really low points. I did not like Melmoth, I did not like Reed's, really the whole Mothers and Daughters arc. It, it left me very cold. Um, the fact is, this book was selling 36,000 copies an issue, and then it went to a point where around issue 178, Dave Sims said his controversial things about women, and the readership start was, it was seriously declining. It was seriously declining. And by the time it finished, it was only publishing about 3,000 copies an issue. Uh, that's a pretty steep drop. Uh, it's, not, it's not accurate to say that the book ended like its title character, alone, unmourned, and unloved, but there's enough similarities that it's worth at least noting. Uh, Anyway, Cerebus, controversial title. Uh, I was reading it in the 80s before Dave Sim was really saying some of these controversial things. Uh, I sort of fell out somewhere around Melmoth. Um, I've gone back and, and read uh, the book. I don't know. It, it's interesting. I, I do feel like the first third is a lot stronger than everything else. Um, it has a good ending. It has a decent ending. Uh, it's it, it, it does have some of... Dave Sims' controversial views embedded within it, and at the same time, uh, it's 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 honest with itself. It it it, it stays true to the character. Uh, anyway, those are my final thoughts. Uh, let's end things on a good note. Let's take a quick look at what kind of fan art came in this week. Bruno from Mexico sent in an Avengers-inspired piece of artwork. You can see more of Bruno's work on YouTube and Instagram. The Spectre guest stars in this artwork by Eric Russell, in which I'm about to put Infotron down, Mice or Men style. Kyle Horn created a riff on The Killing Joke. You can see his children's book artwork on his site and more on Instagram. Oh no, I'm using the Infinity Gauntlet to snap away my own show. This illustration was sent in by Raf, and he includes his Instagram link. Pedro Mesquita from Brazil says that he was inspired to do this portrait of me after looking at Judge Death Art. You can see more of Pedro's art on Instagram. Grimlock has become a fan art regular with riffs on various 80s properties. This time, I visit the world of the Thundercats. Tyler Garcia returns once more with a new piece of art featuring me leaving the comic store. Wiley Parkhurst sends in a new illustration. This is me meeting my Oddlaw, which is apparently some sort of doppelganger in the Where's Waldo books. If you would like to have your artwork shown, as long as it has something to do with this channel, Comic Tropes, I'm happy to feature it. Just send it to this address, comictropes at gmail.com. I'll feature it, and then on top of that, I will pick a random winner out of those entries to get a Gachapon prize. I picked these up in Japan myself, and they come out of the Gacha Pony machine, which was donated by Lunar Shine Store, so check them out. All right, so there were uh, eight entries this week, but Wiley Parkhurst has already won, so he's removed from the running. He volunteered that, and uh, that leaves me with seven numbers to drop into a bag and randomly choose one. Let's see who wins this week. It is number two, and number two was Eric Russell. Eric Russell, let's see what you won. All right. Little, 
gotcha pond inside a bigger one. Oh, cool. I remember this. It's like a, uh, it's, it's a weird cat that I think like, uh, grabs a hold of like a pencil or something like that. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's cute. It's cute. It's a cute cat. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to keep this short. This was a long episode. Just want to say uh, thank you so much for your support. Uh, if you would like to support the show on an ongoing basis, I have a Patreon. Uh, if you want to do a one-time tip, I have a coffee account. I'm always grateful for that. It helps offset some of the costs to produce this show. Uh, and uh, the channel's growing. Much obliged. So remember to hit like, subscribe, Share it with some friends if you like this episode. And I'm definitely curious this week to hear some of your comments on can you separate art from the artist, uh, especially in cases where the artist has said something or done something objectionable. Can you still appreciate their artwork? Or in some cases, I believe you can't help but think about the artist the whole time. But maybe that's just me. I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for this uh, episode. And until next time, keep reading comics.